Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Free Thought Radio presents the Mythicist Milwaukee Show. It's 7 p.m. on Sunday. And as always, we come to you from the storefront at 824 East Center Street in beautiful River West, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. River West, film and video, the home of Free Thought Radio. I'm your host, Rob Moore. With me, as always, Brian Kester. How's it going, Brian? Very good, very good. You can tweet us live at Mythicist MKE. That's at Mythicist MKE. As always, Sean Antonio. Sean and Antonio Manning. The tweet lines. Tonight, we are excited. Our guest is a writer, a public speaker, a historical researcher, a biblical scholar, dare I say. I may go out of bounds on the intro here, pre-written for me. He's been actively investigating the historical Jesus question for over 10 years. He has a degree in history and was an associate member of CSER. Sounds like a crime show on TV, doesn't it, guys? The former committee for the scientific examination of religion. He is the author of Nailed, and I love this title, don't you? Nailed, 10 Christian Myths that show Jesus never existed at all. And the Complete Heretic's Guide to Western Religion, book one, The Mormons. It's a scary title right there. Secretly, maybe not anymore, we're giving away the secret. He is also an award-winning sci-fi fantasy, and maybe I'm gonna spend a minute asking about this. Uh, an an award-winning sci-fi slash fantasy slash paranormal erotica writer under the pen name, Killed Kilpatrick. His most recent Discussion focused on the Mormon religion, LDS, where he points out how far one's mind must stretch in order to believe in it. David is an LGBT activist, a feminist, and a voice for others to feel stronger about themselves in the harsh world in which we live. He's been called one of the busiest atheist activists in the Bay Area, in addition to serving on the board of San Francisco Atheists and Center for Inquiry San Francisco. He is also the director, co-founder, of both the world's first atheist film festival, that's exciting for me, a cinephile, and Evolution Palooza, San Francisco's oldest annual Darwin Day celebration. It's a pleasure to welcome David Fitzgerald. Are you there, David? I'm there. Thank you. Can you hear me? For hanging on for that long we introduction. We can, we can. Thanks for joining us. You there? I am. Thank I you, am. thank you, I apologize. Uh, and speaking of apologists, uh, my guys want me to start off with a, uh, a popular quote when it comes to Jesus mythicism. And this is, uh, of course, our good buddy Nick Peters. When I say this position is not to be granted respect in the academic community, I mean it. No one who wants to consider themselves an academic should hold such a view. The academic community does, does not take this seriously at all. The claims that are really popular on the Internet are not at all discussed by academic scholars in the field. Is the idea that Jesus, that the Jesus myth uh, is a myth, is it, is it a ridiculous idea? Why is it so difficult to get the academic community to, to grasp onto this? Well, the funny thing about it is it's not quite just the academic community. It's the biblical historian community, which is predominantly the Christian biblical historical community. There are secular biblical scholars. In fact, I argue that they're the ones that are only the only ones doing the real work anymore in biblical studies. Um, but for the longest time, biblical studies has been historically dominated, not just by Christians, but generally by Christian clergymen and preachers. So they're not just dependent on Christ for their salvation; they're dependent on him for their salaries. And either one of those is enough for them to reject the idea out of hand. Um, it doesn't really bother me when I hear crazy crap like that from Christians because it, they certainly say worse and with a lot less evidence. <laughs> um, but it does bother me when I get that from our fellow atheists, and especially from atheist historians like Bart Ehrman, who I adore and love um, and agree with 99 percent of what he writes. Um, and if, for a staunch historicist, I keep saying that he's one of the best mythicist writers out there. Um, the new book that I'm working on now is the follow-up to Nailed. This one is called Jesus Mything in Action. And a big chunk of the book 
has turned out to be talking about the state of affairs in biblical studies, and in particular, Jesus studies, and what, uh, what an incredible circus of disaster that's become. Uh, there were some other words I was going to say, but I'm not sure if we can say them on this radio show. No, nah, keep it clean. <laughs> yeah. Damn family program. Um, fair enough. Well, here's the thing, um, and it's not just atheists who complain about this, but even Christian biblical historians, devout Christians, for at least 80 years now, and certainly 40 years, and certainly um, rec more recent than that, we've had waves of historians saying that the criteria that we've been using to determine what's authentic Jesus tradition and what's inauthentic just doesn't work. Um, and for hundreds of years, biblical historians, and Jesus historians in particular, have gone on what they call these quests of uh, hunting down the historical Jesus, not the Jesus of faith, which we all know didn't really exist, but the real Jesus who's you know, presumably behind him. Um, and again, there have been, since in the last 200 and some odd years, there have been three of these quests, and every single one of them has ended in a failure, and they've had to go back to square one, back to the drawing board, and start again with a whole new criteria. Sometimes the criteria are the opposite tools that they were using in the last quest. But in any case, they have failed to document a single fact about Jesus' real life. Um, it's astounding, and it's unparalleled. I can't think of any other field of history, let alone science, where after 200 years of study, we know less and less about the subject of study than we do now. I, get, I sure get what you're saying about the, the Christians uh, and those involved in the in the actual money making machine. But what do what do what do atheists have to gain by hanging on to this? What's a guy like Ermin? What what, what does he possibly have to by, uh, to gain by pulling the wool over his own eyes? Yeah, and and again, I don't want to say like it's a conspiracy or anything like that. I don't think that's any such thing. It's just Christians being Christians. And in the case of secular historians, biblical historians, it's hard to find a single secular historian who doesn't come out of a religious background. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any at all, including myself, including Richard Carrier, Robert Bryce, all the other uh, famous mythicists. Um, and another point I make in the new book is that these presumptions that we've inherited from the Christians have clouded biblical studies all along, right from the get-go. Um, I was talking to Richard Carey about this not too long ago, and he was saying um, in his last debate with Mark Goodacre, who's a secular historian, biblical historian, um, they're both atheists, they're both secular biblical historians. Mark uh, believes there, there was probably a historical Jesus. Rick doesn't. Uh, but it was interesting, in their debate, um, Mark kept bringing up evidence of such and such in the Scripture, such and such in Paul's letter, and Richard would have to stop and say, oh, wait a second. That is not true. That doesn't exist. And um, again and again, we have these presumptions that, oh, we know, what, we know what is in the Gospels. We know what's in Paul's letter, and they're all, they all corroborate each other. And it's not the case at all. Christianity before the Gospels were written worships a Jesus that's very different from the Jesus or Jesuses, if you will, that came after the Gospels were written uh, towards the end of the first century and the beginning of the second century. Speaking of that, uh, and that was one of the red flags for me when I first got interested in the subject. Uh, um, I had been a happy atheist for years and years before it ever even crossed my mind there might not be a Jesus. It just, I, of course, there was a Jesus. How could there not be? The the, uh, the idea that there wasn't one never had even occurred to me at all. Um, it wasn't until I started getting interested in what was our historical evidence for him and how we could tell what are the things that he really said and did, and what was just legendary baloney that was added later, uh, legendary creation that came afterwards. Um, and that's where I got in trouble, because almost immediately I was stunned to find how little good evidence we have for Jesus. It's wrong to say we have no evidence for Jesus. We have lots of evidence. We don't have very many, much good evidence. Um, and our sources are much smaller than I ever thought. When, before I started looking. 
I had a similar experience to you as I came to atheism from a religious background, a liberal Protestant background where we never really, no one ever leaned on the Bible as any kind of literal story of anything. It was very, very much a, a, a parable and a metaphor and a, a you know, and a, a loose maybe historical interpretation. But just like you, it never dawned on me to think that maybe Jesus never existed at all until I met my friends here, the mythicists, and quickly uh, uh, became an instant convert, really. Uh, but uh, those of us here are then uh, uh, being preached to, of course, uh, as members of the choir. Take us to the beginning for the lay person who's listening and maybe is on the fence about this and is coming from their own uh, religious background but has an open mind to this. Did, did, uh, did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John even exist? Did they write the Gospels? Uh, give us a little bit of the, the, the background there. These are all good questions. I'll ask you to prompt me that second one in a minute, but let me start with this. I like what Robert, Robert Price says about this, that for all extents and purposes, even if there really had been a first century Jewish preacher named Jesus somewhere in Judea who did anything remotely like what we think he did, for all extents and purposes, that guy doesn't exist anymore because all the evidence we have about his life is unconnected to anyone who actually lived in the first century. For us, all our sources boil down to the New Testament, but even more than that, more than the, the New Testament itself, it boils down basically just to the four Gospels. And those four Gospels all boil down to the first Gospel, Mark, which appears to be written as an allegory completely. Um, yeah, where to start with that? I guess it, it does goes back to the the Gospels. Um, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three of them are called the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic in Greek means seen together, and it's called that. They're the three, the trio of them is called that because you can take them, line them up next to each other, and you can see where they line up identically, not just. They're saying the same story, or it's a similar version of the story. They are saying word for word exactly the same thing, or they've made switches to it that make it obvious that they're working off the same thing, that they've cut and pasted and made deliberate uh, corrections or changes, depending on how you want to see that. Um, Mark itself, and many scholars have commented about this, is full of these scenarios and situations and events that couldn't happen Historically, They just make no sense historically. They couldn't have happened. And yet they make perfect sense as an allegory for, for Jewish themes like Yom Kippur, the Yom Kippur ritual, um, for um, Hebrew gematria, uh, sacred geometry, they called it. All these, what we would call, you know, astrological or occult um, uh, mumbo jumbo to us, but to them it was spiritual truths that they were encoding. Um, encoding makes it sound too strong a word, too Illuminati esque. Um, they were making an allegory. The, the author of Mark was making an allegory, um, and he was writing around the time of AD seventy, the early seventies, right after the war with Rome, uh, when the temple had been destroyed and Judaism was in complete flux and didn't know what was going to happen, didn't know why the Messiah hadn't come to save Jerusalem. Uh, and the end of the world surely was going to be happening any minute. That was the situation when Mark, when the guy we call Mark, wrote his gospel. Um, all the gospels originally, I say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but all of them were originally anonymous. Uh, those names weren't attached to them until sometime in the second century, late in the second century at that. Um, all of them, none of them claim to be eyewitness accounts. None of them read like eyewitness accounts. And all of them contain giveaways that they're being written decades, at least after the time that they describe, um, especially uh, Matthew and Luke, uh, but even, even the first one, Mark. Uh, John is so different from the other three Gospels that um, he doesn't even try to match up with them uh, as far as keeping the same story um, or same timeline. Now, why, what significance do the names have? If these were originally anonymous, what sort of names are these? Why were they, why were they chosen? Do they signify anything? Well, it's interesting. Actually, a lot of the names that we see in the Gospels are very apt names, like curiously apt names. Uh, for instance, Matthew means disciple. It comes from the, the, the Aramaic Hebrew word for disciple. Um, Arimathea, Joseph of Arimathea, 
we've never found that town. It doesn't appear anywhere in ancient writings before the Gospels were written, and that's the first time it appears is on all four Gospels. Arimathea means town of the best disciple. Um, and there's all these cutesy, you know, uh, the, the book of Luke and Acts are both addressed to a guy named Theophilus, which means lover of God. So there's all these cute little literary touches um, that don't sound very plausible if we're talking about real people or real events, but they sound like literary uh, characters. And the names we get that that have been attached to those four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all come from people who are mentioned in Paul's letters, his genuine letters, rather. Uh, uh, Minor characters that we don't really know much about, actually. Um, Everything we know about them came from later traditions that happened afterwards. Um, And there's, of course, in the second century, there are lots of other Gospels written under other different names that were also taken from um, uh, characters that usually start out in Paul's letters and become characters in the Gospels. David, for for those of you are for those not familiar with uh, Yom Kippur, I, I believe the tradition is that you would sacrifice a pristine goat and then drive a scapegoat out of the city and throw the the tribe's sins onto that goat. A- am I correct? And are you arguing that that the crucifixion, the the sacrifice of a perfect individual, is a mirror of that? No, you're absolutely right. And what I'm referring to specifically is the incident where uh, Pilate gives the people their choice of two criminals, Jesus or Barabbas. The interesting thing about Barabbas, he is a murderer. He's an anti-Roman rebel. Um, He's he's just a bad hombre altogether. Um, And yet, for some reason, the crowds have asked for him to be released and for Jesus to be killed. And when you look at it, just from a linguistic, not a linguistic, but a literary point, Barabbas, the name itself is a tip-off that there's something going on. Barabbas in Aramaic means son of the father. And in fact, in some Syrian manuscripts, his name is Jesus Barabbas. So you have two sons of the father, two Jesus Barabbases. Um, One is perfect and without flaw, but he gets executed. He gets sacrificed. The other one carries the sins of wickedness, of, of, of uh, murder and uh, apostasy, um, and yet he is released unharmed into the wilderness. Barabbas is the scapegoat. Jesus is the goat uh, uh, that is of sacrifice. Um, it's a perfect analogy, an allegory for the Yom Kippur ritual. Did, did people at the time like see this and say, wow, look at how it all comes together. Look at the tie-ins. This is awesome. I think they did. In fact, I think whenever we had a person writing a gospel and they put in things like this, I think they fully expected their educated members of the audience to recognize that that's what they were doing because there's all these allusions to both uh, Greek themes and motifs and to Hebrew classic Jewish uh, motifs and Septuagint passages uh, from the Greek version of the Hebrew scriptures. Um, They expected the more educated ones to read it and to understand their code talk. Um, and they expected the people who didn't, you know, the children, those that little in faith, who were just growing up into the faith, they expected them to just appreciate and understand the story. And what happened, and we see this a lot with other religions too, with Mithraism, with all these other mystery faiths of the, in the Hellenistic period. Um, and in the case of Christianity, what happened is the tail started wagging the dog, and the, the stories about Jesus took on a life of their own. Once that became so popular, then kind of the allegories got lost and, uh, you know, swept under the carpet. Not really, but um, the, the deeper truths that they, the monks, thought were so important um, got lost on the common people and everybody else, apparently. We were watching, we were listening to, uh, excuse me, we were listening to your talk from uh, the Humanist Community Forum. Uh, and uh, before the show started, 10 Beautiful Lies About Jesus. And the Barabbas story stuck out to me. Uh, I, I love that, and thank you, Brian, for bringing that up uh, as a nugget of, uh, of wisdom uh, that I hadn't heard before. And, and you mentioned that this is a common uh, a literary device, really, to, to, uh, to mirror rituals uh, from the religious world in, in these stories. I'd really love to hear another one. Do you have another example of that kind of thing? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll give you on the flip side. Uh, Mithraism. We don't know a lot about Mithraism, but we know from its central iconography, the central image of Mithraism is of the god Mithras slaying the bull. And it, was, it hasn't been all that long since I think the 80s that uh, historians looked at it and said, oh my goodness, there's a bull, there's a scorpion, there's a raven, all these images in this story. And they said, this is a star chart. These are astrological symbols here. And it was it discovered that the whole religion of Mithraism, which was sort of a sister's religion to, to Christianity, it, it predates it by about 60 years or so, um, that whole religion was started to celebrate or celebrate, call attention to, whatever you want to say it, a thing, an astronomical phenomenon called the procession of the equinoxes. Um, to us, it's not really that big a deal. It's kind of an obscure astronomical phenomenon. But if you believed like they did that the sky, the universe is a huge dome that's over the flat earth and that it's, it's, uh, that, that what you see up in there isn't just um, – an odd, it's not just an odd little constellation shift. For them, it looked like the entire universe was shifting on its axis. To them, it was a huge deal and marked off this huge epoch um, for them. And so we see that reflected in the iconography of Mithras. Um, the story of Mithras slaying the bull is encoding a higher truth about, in this case, an astronomical phenomenon. Interesting. We, we've also heard that the th rising after the third day is is part due to the solstice that the sun reaches its nadir and is at the lowest point stays there for three days and then rises again i mean if you studied other religions where they the stellar star charts and and things that were known really is the the genesis of all these i i tend to think that um i know some people have a problem with that i think basically the further we go back in religions, the more it seems to be founded on that. A lot of those parallels don't always hold up or they're inconclusive and we can't say for sure. And I think sometimes we get a little overconfident about saying, oh, this means this, this means that. And we need to be careful about that. But in general, I do think that um, there are – that a lot of what we think of as religion originally started from people looking at the stars – and, you know, being aware of how they – being in touch with the seasons, how they changed, how dependent they were on for planting your crops, calving your herds, you know, when to slaughter them, that kind of thing, when the sun would come back. Um, I think that's, that's been downplayed uh, in, in most religions. Uh, I feel like I had another point I was going to make about that. Um, <laughs> No, nah, it'll, it'll, maybe it'll come back to me. Well, it's okay. Uh, again, Mr. Fitzgerald, thank you so much for being on the Mythos of Milwaukee show today. Uh, this is Antonio. We just, I wanted to ask, what do you think it is um, that made Christianity um, reach the levels that we have today? What, what really sparked off the, uh, the growth of this uh, religion uh, that really we're seeing that it, you know, it's founded on uh, some, uh, you know, a astronomical uh, phenomenon uh, such as sun worship, um, but it's it's based off of a farce and lies, and we have no evidence of, of Jesus. But what is it then that made it uh, jump off? Yeah, and it, it, it just occurred to me, I remembered what my earlier thought was, is I don't think it was all just astronom uh, astronomy, but there a lot of Jewish, there was a rich culture, not just Jewish um theology, but Mesopotamian theology, and these images and these motifs and these themes kept getting repeated and repeated through the Jewish scriptures and the Old Testament, um, you know, one after another, and even into the New Testament. So when they were creating these mystery faiths and when they were creating early Christianity, which I argue, and I'm not the only, the only one that does this, that, that Christianity is a mystery faith. Um, they were drawing on this rich, rich uh, lineage, uh, if you will, of, uh, of theological ideas. It wasn't, didn't start out as a scam. It didn't start out as a farce to them. Um, Mormonism, 
I would argue, did start out as a scam and did start out as a farce. Um, and yet it's a, a, a huge million plus, you know, religion. Um, it's not as big as they'd like us to think, but it certainly has had a great history for being sheer, unflinching BS. Um, and there's no polite way to say it. There's no way in hell Mormonism is based on anything but a con artist. Um, but Christianity and and other religions, maybe they started with just as much cynicism, but it seems to me that they didn't. It seems like it was, an, uh, a, for lack of a better word, authentic attempt to bring their theology to life. Um, and they were writing it, um, you know, with, with loftier goals in mind than just trying to fool people. Um, I think they really believed that they had important things that God was trying to tell them through Scripture. And the best way to get that message from their God across was to retell it in a new story. And we see that happening over and over again in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. Speaking of cynicism, um, I'd always thought, I, I grew up Catholic, and you have to, at Easter, you know, crank out the uh, the, the Gospels of, um, you know, we want Barabbas. And I always felt like, why, why do we have to scream that? I felt if we got enough people together and said, we want Jesus, then, you know, the ending would change and we all could leave. What you you know what's funny about that? It was just 12 hours earlier, the chief priest said, Oh, everyone loves Jesus so much, you know, they're going to turn against us. We've got to, we've got to stop them. And he just welcomes him as their new king of the <laughs> yes. Jews. Um, he's, I mean, he's a miracle-working savior, and yet all it took was just a little spirited cheerleaders to, uh, cheerleading to uh, turn the whole town against him, apparently. Um, well, funny. the funny thing about that, actually, is that that whole trial sequence and that whole story of him, Pilate, releasing, you know, these two to make their choice, that's complete crap. There's no, there's no Jewish tradition of that. There's no Roman tradition of that. And Christians have... What do you mean of giving the prisoner away? There, there's no tradition of releasing a prisoner, right? Is that what exactly. The, the, yeah, what they call the, the, the privilegium paschal, um, the Easter uh, releasing a prisoner. That is complete nonsense. Yeah, why, would never there happened. why would there be? The Romans wouldn't have done that. It's craziness. Exactly. And even if they did, they never would have released somebody like Barabbas, who was an anti-Roman rebel, even if they did something like that. You know. And anyway, yeah, it makes no sense whatsoever. In fact, most of the aspects of Jesus' trial and execution make no sense historically. And people, Jewish scholars have been saying that for decades, I mean, for centuries. Um, even in the ancient world, there were um, critics who were saying, hey, wait a second, this or that aspect of the gospel doesn't even make any sense. You Speaking know? of history, uh, do, does, history confirm, does history confirm any of the gospel? Does archaeology confirm <laughs> any of what the gospels not. are saying at all? And it always kills me how you hear things. Christians, and it bless their hearts, I mean, what else are they going to say? But they say <laughs> the most ridiculous things in defense. And for instance, like, oh, um, Luke, he's an excellent historian. He's awesome historian, one of the best historians of all time. And where do they get that from? Well, he says right in the beginning that he's an excellent historian. So naturally, it must be true. Well, the Bible says it's true, so it must be true. I believe everything I read on the Internet. When I was growing up, we, we were told that Luke was a physician. That was my mom's take on it. And, and as I said, Yeah, he's supposed to be a physician. He's also supposed to be a painter, uh, supposed to be a companion of Paul. Oh, he's supposed to be a lot of things. Companion, I like uh, that. And again, that comes from a minor character that appears in Paul's letters. He mentions that... Um, Luke, Dr. Luke is with me, basically. And that's all, but that was enough to somebody attach it and then start that character going. Um, all the early leaders of the Jerusalem church, James, Peter, Kephas, uh, John, those all became um, disciples in, in the Gospels. But when you hear Paul talking about them, he in Galatians goes up and says, uh, I didn't meet any apostles. I only met uh, James, the brother of the Lord. And then describing this guy who we think of, he's saying James is the brother of Jesus. He's saying, oh, these guys are nobodies. In fact, they're not even real Christians. In fact, I didn't give him to him for a minute. And it's like all throughout the book of Galatians, he's talking about how much he hates these guys and and how, you know, uh, and that, that, that all the fights that he gets into them. And then when you get to Luke's gospel, Oh, they love each other, and they were friends right from the get-go. And and you know, it's 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 crazy on every point where you can match up something that Paul says, talks about, 
and the way Luke describes it, Luke is lying about it. He's whitewashing it and making it all pretty so that everybody's all on the same side. Uh, same side. Clarify for me, if you would, how John differs from the Synoptic Gospels. Mostly, um, he, his working, reworking of Mark and Luke and Matthew isn't as blatant as the other three. The other three literally are cutting and pasting from Mark. Um, John will take things, uh, for instance, um, we call it John. The actual gospel doesn't say it's written by John. It says it was written, well, first of all, it's written anonymously, but it has a character called the beloved disciple, this unnamed beloved disciple. And the a, a later editor has added on in one of the endings that got tacked on to John, says, oh, and he's the guy who wrote this, and we know it's true because he wrote it. It was dedicated uh, to him. But this character doesn't appear in any of the other Gospels. And when he does appear uh, in, towards the end of, of this Gospel, it's always to, like, show up in a story that we see from Luke or from Matthew, and he, like, one-ups all the apostles. Like, for instance, um, Luke has Peter uh, hearing that... Uh, Jesus is raised him from his tomb, and so he gets up and runs to the tomb ahead of everybody else and sees it for himself. Well, in John's gospel, Luke, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, John, or, sorry, <laughs> Peter and the beloved disciple get up and run, and the beloved disciple beats him to their rights and gets there first. And so it's just these weird little insertions of this guy that nobody else knows about um, uh, to make the point, I don't know what the point is supposed to be, that he's better and a closer witness than anybody else, and so that's why we should trust this gospel. I have you more camels kind of than you argument? Also. What's that? I have more camels than you trying to, uh, you know, well, up the I Joneses. think they want to say, and this guy was Jesus' bestest, bestest buddy. He loved him the best of all, so you know this gospel is the real deal. Mm. Luke likes to say things like, oh, so many people are writing gospels these days. It seemed a good idea to me to go back and ask everybody what the real scoop was right from the beginning and get the real scoop. So he's implying that he's the only one uh -huh. that's giving the real gospel, just as John is implying that they're the only one giving the real gospel. Um, and so many gospels didn't make the cut, and they were doing the same thing, too. Um, another difference from John and the synoptic gospels, uh, for instance, they – well, all the gospels differ on why the Romans cared about killing him um, – what various and crucial things in there, like what his re relationship to John the Baptist was. Um, but one of the, the real marked ones is uh, in John's Gospels, the Jews want to kill him because he's raised Lazarus from the dead, and it freaks everybody out. It drives, the whole country goes wild over it, and, um, and they are afraid that Jesus has gotten too popular or whatever. You know, he raises Lazarus from the dead, but he's got to go. And that's only well, in John's Lazarus Gospel. Lazarus doesn't even show up. Lazarus doesn't even appear in any of the other Gospels except as a name of a fictional character in one of Luke's parables. Mm. Um, in all the other Gospels, there's different reasons why the, the Jews want him dead. Um, in fact, it's usually because um, he, clean, he uh, drove the money changers out of the temple. But in John's Gospel... That didn't happen the last week of his life like it does in the other three Gospels. It happens the first thing he does at the beginning of his three-year ministry. <laughs> um, and again, it's, it's things like that that he doesn't even have Jesus die on the same day. I mean, the differences between the Gospels on, like, really basic, crucial things dog pile up so fast it is hard to keep track of them. And, and speaking of wanting to, to kill people, I mean, getting back to the historicity argument, we, we were told that Herod went and killed every baby under two years old. I'm suspecting that the soldiers didn't first ask if they were Jewish. They just went after them, right? And it, 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 is there any histor historicity to this? Or what do we know about Pontius Pilate and um, the real Pontius Pilate versus how he's portrayed in the Gospels? Oh, yeah, the real Pontius Pilate. Let's go back to Herod, but the real Pontius Pilate is nothing like the little Nancy boy they've got in the Gospels, who just keeps pushed around by those mean Jewish uh, <laughs> boy. priests and scribes, and, and he's like, oh, wait, okay, okay, you know, I give. <laughs> um, everything we know about the real Pontius Pilate was the, just the exact opposite, that he would never do what the Jews begged him to do and always do what they begged him not to do. 
And when he finally did get in trouble with Caesar, it wasn't because he was, you know, reluctant to crucify anybody. It was because he had one too many massacres on his <laughs> hands. And they finally said, OK, we got to pull this guy out of here. He's a bit of a maniac. Right. That, that, that's um, bad for tax collecting when you're dead. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nothing could be further from the truth. That's just one of, that's just one of the ways that the history in the Gospels is just completely wrong, and we know it's wrong. Another thing is that the Pharisees, uh, it says things like, oh, they hated him, and, and Jesus didn't teach like the Pharisees. Well, yeah, he did, because he mo- a lot of what he's saying came from the Pharisees. The Pharisees would have loved somebody like Jesus. They hated the Sadducees, the fat cats who were in cahoots with the Romans, just as much as anybody like Jesus did. They would have loved a guy like Jesus. Okay, so the um, Pharisees Herod, were, were like they, the, the true Jews and Sadducees were like the, the uh, I don't know, the, that it stuck, uh, what, what's the word, that sell, the sellouts? <laughs> well, they were, I mean, they were, they were just one more faction of Judaism. Um, they had their own thing. The thing that I remember about Judaism in the first century is there were dozens, you know, you know many, 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 types of Judaism. There was no one type of Judaism. It's never been so diverse. Um, What we think of as Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, didn't even get started until the same time Christianity did, uh, after the the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. Um, About the same time the Gospels were beginning to be written, that's the same time that Judaism, our modern Judaism, was starting to show up. You're definitely teaching me. I did not know that. What, what about Herod? Any, any t- historical references to that or even close? Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Herod had lots of enemies, and they took great pleasure in documenting all the stuff he did. So if he actually did order a massacre of uh, all the baby boys in Bethlehem, um, you know, which was just five or six miles from Jerusalem, that would have made it into the history books. What's more is the uh, guys who wrote the Gospels forget that, well, John the Baptist was born around then. So if he, if he was born around that same time, he would have been killed in that little roundup. And in fact, that doesn't occur to any of the Gospel writers. Uh, it's not until um, second or third or fourth century uh, I forget what the name of the Proto Evangelon of James, I think, where somebody says, Oh, yeah, and so John uh, uh, and his mom hid, and a mountain was lifted up and covered them up, or something like that. Some miracle to, to conveniently uh, explain why John the Baptist wasn't killed in that little Well, roundup. maybe he was put under the rug, like, you know, every other, every other inconsistency. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, Herod was notorious in Rome for having his two sons killed. And some people thought, well, maybe that's where they made the connection that Herod uh-huh. killed these two innocent sons, and that story got used or inspired, you know, the um, the story in the Gospels. But really, we don't have to look too hard for historicity, for inspiration in the Gospels, because most of the stories in the Gospels, especially Mark's first story, which that doesn't appear in, but um, they seem to be inspired by things in Scripture and from allegories about other, um, you know, Jesus is a new Joshua, he's a new Adam, he's a new Moses, um, and their stories come about from that. Well, I don't know, okay, one more on the historicity. I mean, what about the um, David himself? You know, I, everyone's descended there. I mean, Christianity is intrinsically linked to Judaism. What, what about the existence of, of David or anything like that? The interesting thing about David, um, one, one thing I, 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 if you've seen my talk on sex and violence in the Bible, I have. I talk about how his rise to power is really awfully convenient. It reads more like a Shakespearean play than anything in lofty or uh, biblical. And because maybe he really did love Jonathan and Saul and was a loyal follower. And maybe it's just a coincidence that Saul and Jonathan and all the other heirs to the throne all happened to get themselves killed. Uh, and often the only witness to this were other soldiers of, of David who got killed, you know, who also got killed, you know, by other soldiers of David, rather. Um, the witnesses, not the soldiers. Um, uh, so so there's, there's some, some question about the character of David. Um, other people have, have wondered if David and Solomon are both about as real as King Arthur was or Robin Hood was, that yes, there was a guy like that at the time, but their exploits got blown up all out of proportion. You know, and I, I tend to, to lean towards that. There's a great book called The Bible Unearthed 
uh, by these two Tel Aviv archaeologists, Neil Silverman and Israel Finkelstein. And they've done a great job of just uncorking the whole Old Testament and saying, this never happened. This clearly never happened. We do not have any archaeological evidence to support, for instance, the Exodus story or that Egypt ever even had slaves. We know they didn't build the pyramids. Um, um, all these mainstays of, of Judaism that got inherited by Christianity, um, almost none of them are true. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very tough to, to look at anything going on in the Old Testament, um, with the exception of like lesser figures like Hezekiah and uh, Josiah and Jezebel. Um, uh, and even when they are mentioned, usually it's in a propaganda slant that we're not getting the real story. And that's the same case with a lot of New Testament figures, too. For instance, Paul. Um, we all know Paul, and Paul really was a real figure, but half of what we know from about Paul is written by Luke and is usually um, contradicted by things that Paul said. So the Paul that we all love, the super Paul of Luke, that guy never existed. The kind of bitchy, whiny, bitter uh, Paul, yeah, that guy existed. But uh, we don't like him so much. It's 740. You are listening to www.riverwestradio.com. Soon going FM to be pulsating at 100 watts of screeching FM power. The home of Free Thought Radio. We have a tweet from fellow fan, and it just went away. Uh, but I do have a question from the audience. A listener wants to know. Uh, oh, here we go. Back up. Uh, Miguel Connor. Are you familiar with Miguel Connor? I'm sorry. With, with who? Are you familiar with Miguel Connor? I, the name's not ringing a bell. From Aeon Byte Radio. He's a podcast host and a mythicist. Uh, no, no. He says, uh, another excellent guest and a good man. He's listening. Shout out to uh, you from, you, uh, from uh, a fan. Um, but as I say, uh, we are uh, uh, going FM soon, and I uh, need to pump our Power the Tower celebration, which is a, uh, a little fundraiser and a party that is going to go on December 19th. River West Radio formally invites you to the Power the Tower celebration, where we will announce the new call letters. Of course, there's a little contest going on to pick the call letters for the radio station to be. We are currently worldwide on the web, but we will be... FM soon and we'll be having to uh, be able to hear your voice over the airwaves and that's exciting for everybody. That's going to be at the Jazz Gallery Center for the Arts at 926 East Center Street. That's just down the road here, 926 East Center Street, December 19th 6 to 11 p.m. So come on out and party and uh, bring a little bit of, uh, of a donation. Uh, it's time for a feature we like to call Myth or Money where we ask a question related to uh, this week's guest. This week's guest, of course, is David Fitzgerald, author of Nailed. And the question is... The question um, is, and we like to say, where uh, the myth may not be real, but the money is. And David, sorry, you don't get to, uh, you don't get to answer this. But uh, if, you, uh, if our listeners can email us or tweet us within 24 hours, we'll pick a uh, winner from one of the right answers. I want to know um, what scale David Fitzgerald used to rate some biblical stories. And by scale, I mean the Scoville scale measures pepper hotness, and the Richter scale measures earthquake magnitude. What scale did, David's, uh, did David Fitzgerald use um, in this? And if you, I'll give you people a hint, um, Google Ruth and Boaz, and uh, check to one of those YouTubes, and you'll probably find that answer. And what are they? And it's Horus, H O R U S, 414 at Gmail or Mythicist MKE. What do they stand to win, Brian? They Edwards? stand to win $20, of which you could potentially maybe buy uh, David Fitzgerald's uh, book, Nailed. Is that true, David? Is that about with, that with that cover? That would be an excellent use of that money. <laughs> uh, also, I'm interested in, the, uh, in the, the new book, The Complete Heretic's Guide uh, to, uh, to, to, to Christmas. Is that what we're, uh, we're looking at? That's that's actually a uh, TV special that's going uh, out this this month or this next month rather, in December. Or yeah. Jesus missing in action. When are we going to see that? 
That, that is a great question. I am. I was literally working on it up to the minute that we uh, started broadcasting tonight, and I'm hoping to get it out as soon as possible. I'd love it to be out by the end of the year, but uh, I'd really love it to be out in time for next year's American Atheist. It'll just be out when it's out. There's just so much more to the topic that I want to cover. I'm. I'm I started out. Um, I just want to kind of give a bare bones. Well, let me let me back that up. The the whole idea of the book is to answer the the arguments that I get not from Christians but from our fellow atheists who say, oh yeah yeah I know that Jesus wasn't the son of God but there really was a Jesus, and um, this is to not make them into Jesus atheists but to at least make them into Jesus agnostics, um, and point out how the the sources that we have for Jesus are extremely problematic, the sort the the state of Jesus studies is dubious at best and a real shambles to be honest and i just point out i want to point out how i think the actual timeline of early christianity uh unfolded and i'm about uh maybe two-thirds the way to the book now but it is slow going because there is a lot of information to pack in this puppy your complete heretics Uh, guide that is done is the mormon um, uh book correct that is correct. That, no. That's the first book in the new series. This book that I'm working on now, it's Jesus Mything in Action. It's both the follow-up to Nailed, and it's the second book in the series. You know, perhaps the, uh, the winner could use the money for a Roku subscription and um, log on to Atheist TV. What are, what are you doing there, David? Uh, that's where the, Atheist, uh, the, com- no, sorry, the Complete Heretic's Guide to Christmas is going to be airing this month. Uh, all through December is on the American Atheist channel on Roku. I think that's a great buy too. No, is that a complete guide or is that for complete heretics? Uh, it's the complete heretics guide, <laughs> a guide for the complete heretic. Uh, that's not being funny. Right. Uh, you that meet would, it Millie ways. That would include me. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, but I wanted to touch on Adam's we wanted to touch on Mormonism once more as mythicists were uh, terribly interested in the uh, the evolution of mythology into modern religions and uh, is, don't you think Mormonism is a, is a perfect modern day example of how a religion is created based on earlier religious characters and myths and stories well Mormonism is special for so many reasons and one of them is is I mentioned to it before. Special. It it starts out as a complete con job, and there's no two ways about it. I mean, um, you could argue that towards the end that Joseph Smith kind of drank his own Kool Aid and believed his own myth, um, and that's why he died. But there's no doubt at all that he was just a con artist, and early Mormonism was filled with characters just like Joseph Smith, who were complete con artists, and no two ways about it. With other religions. I, I think you could say that for a lot of them. I don't think you can say that for all of them, uh, or at least Christianity doesn't seem to have necessarily started out just that way. But it, by the second century, there certainly were a lot of people um, who felt completely free to make up whatever they wanted to <laughs> and assign it to the name of whoever they thought would give them more credit and more respectability. Um I, I- so there was kind of a mixture of, of sincere theological and sincere pious fraud uh, going on. Is there any truth It's a little to hard the... to tell where that starts and stops. I mean, you could say the same thing with just about any religion today, I think. Um, it's hard for me to believe that the Catholic Church hierarchy doesn't know what it's been doing for the last 2,000 years. And I don't just mean covering up pedophilia scandals, but just whole <laughs> the entire – structure of of their religion i think is based on bluster and and you know sheer unflinching commitment to a bit um and i think you can say that for a lot of religions out there we're having a lot of fun meeting uh the national and international guests and it seems to me that there's a lot of guys and gals doing what you do out there uh, uh among those of course seth andrews who uh, uh will be uh, oh, a, it, a, a, a guest um, coming up on the podcast, of course, the host and producer of The Thinking Atheist and a former Christian uh, radio broadcaster, so we're excited to uh, uh, to talk He's to him. He's got some great stories, so you're in for a treat. Another one is D.M. Murdoch, and a uh, listener wants to know what you think of her uh, research and how, uh, uh, how it dovetails with what you uh, feel about the, the Jesus myth. You know, I sort of have a love-hate thing 
with Acharya S. And, you know, I don't want to get into it now, but um, uh, I have the same problem with Freakin' Gandhi. Or actually, a bigger problem with Freakin' Gandhi because they'll say things, but they won't say where they're getting their citation for this. Uh, I have a much bigger problem with them for that because even when they say good things, it's like, well, if you're not going to tell me where you got this from, it's it's useless. And the fact that you're not telling me where it's from probably means it's completely useless. It's not even true. Right. It's for hearsay. Starters. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah. Yeah. Is there a lot of uh, d- d- I mean, is this information that you guys dig up? Is it is it just in a library for anybody to go see, or is it really so obscure and hidden that that there really is different uh, uh, opinions and uh, and secret findings that maybe one person has that somebody else does? I mean, I'm I'm kind of new at this. How's it How's it work? Right. I, well, you, there there is a jungle out there of stuff to be found. That's true. Um, it's kind of like paleontological discoveries that happen because the bones were dug up in 1885, but we just discovered them now in the base, basement of the Chicago Museum, that kind of thing. It's like they're kind of hidden in plain sight. It's like most of what I argued and nailed wasn't new at all, and a lot of it was my majority opinion, but, you know, the consensus opinion of all of scholarship. A lot of what based mythicism is based on is not controversial at all. Um, it's just that mythicists take it a little, their conclusion a little further than most um, uh, biblical scholars are willing to do or are allowed to do by the conditions of their their employment. Um, and and just the fact that m- so many of them are Christian alone, just that bias alone, doesn't mean that they're being dishonest, but it means that's how open they'll be to the idea that hmm, maybe there wasn't a Jesus. Which is to say, not at all. They're going to shoot that idea down in their sleep and not even think about it. What about university scholars with tenure? You would think that they would be a little bit uh, less, be less worried about uh, losing dinero. Let me tell you, I meant to spend a paragraph or two talking about this in the book. I've spent almost three chapters, including a whole chapter that documents case study after case study of all these different tenured Christian professors, total Bible-believing Christians, who argued for something that's not even anywhere near the blasphemy level of saying Jesus didn't exist, though some have actually said that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but these are people who have said very minor things like saying, oh, well, Adam didn't exist, or the, the patriarchs didn't exist, and they have gotten their careers blasted. Really? And I, I, again, I've, I've just gotten... Um, <coughs> Document after documentation of that in the book. And that's one and of the reasons we have tenure. Himself. That's crazy. I'm sorry. That's one of the reasons I think tenure is is granted to certain professors is so it they can be. do that. I mean, acad- academic freedom is supposed to be the reason why it is mm-hmm. granted, and the fact that they even tenured professors have gotten this kind of thing happen to them is a it's a, it's a total travesty. Wow. It's a scandal. And even other Christian biblical historians have argued that it's a travesty and a scandal. And that's the one point I can't emphasize enough is that even Christian biblical scholars have argued that Jesus studies is a shambles and a disgrace and is a huge mess, the ones that are free to be able to do that. And so many aren't. Um, I was going to say a moment ago, uh, Richard Carey has told me he's spoken to historians who say, look, I'm, I'm either with you or I'm agnostic about th- that. But here's the thing. I can't come publicly, out publicly with this at all. I can't even hint that I even warm up to that idea or I will lose my job so fast. You know, uh, it's, 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 it's shocking. It's shocking to me. So the closet it's cases, bad, huh? It's as bad as creationists try to make out the scientific community um, for evolution where they say, oh, big science is, is putting it under their thumb and they're suppressing it. That's not true. That's baloney. But that's exactly what's happening in biblical hmm. studies. Producer Sean has a final thought, and then we're going to uh, cut you off because we're about out of time, David. We thanks. David, again, thank you for coming on the show. Um, one of the topics that we discuss, and we end up defending it just because of the simplicity and the entertainment value, but is the film Zeitgeist. Now, I understand there's a lot of bad scholarship in that film. But without that film, the Mythicist Milwaukee team wouldn't be on the radio digging up all of this stuff and going to Egypt and Greece and doing our own research. Um, 
I guess my question is, and Rob kind of alluded to it, when you have the different scholars arguing on the different subjects of, you know, what, what they feel versus, you know, the other person's theory and the other person's theory, where can we find common ground? And also, what is a project that can start unifying the mythicists? Because obviously we're not seeing the support in the scholarly world. What is yep. something that we can do like a zeitgeist or something that can simplify the information that we all agree on and bring it to the masses and get people interested? These, these are all good questions. And that was actually our biggest complaint with Bart Ehrman's book, uh, Did Jesus Exist? It wasn't because we expected him to agree with us, but we thought it would be the best defense of historicity and clear all the dead wood of the, the things in mythicism that get touted that we know aren't true. Um, like that was Christianity a vengeance of the Romans? No, it wasn't. And if you're smart enough to think up this theory, you should be smart enough to realize why well, it's a total non-starter. The thing to keep in mind is mythicism is just starting to emerge as respectable. In fact, we're not even there to respectable yet. But we're, what we, we're at is we're at the point where it can't be just harumphed away and said, oh, no, that's old stuff from the 19th century. We, we dealt with this all a long time ago. They've never rebuked mythicism. It's never been rebutted. It's never been argued away. It's only been steadfastly ignored. And with the internet, um, it's getting harder and harder to pull off that trick. And religions are feeling it even worse than, than historicists and mythicists. And the last thing I want to say is it's not a fight between mythicists and historicists. There's plenty of people out there, scholars out there, who disagree and think, no, I think pretty sure there was a Jesus, or at least they're, they're agnostic about it. This is a fight between the people who take it seriously enough to at least say it should be argued or, you know, taken seriously, and those who just dismiss it out of hand. That's where the fight is. Perfect final thought. David Fitzgerald, thank you again for joining us, and look for him on the web. Thanks, David. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Bye. Anytime. Bye-bye. Take care. This has been the Mythicist Milwaukee Show. Tune in again next Saturday at 7 p.m. As always, have a good night.